Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, I want to talk about patient empowerment from a rather unusual point of view. A recent Medscape poll shed some light on why patients are treated the way they are by some health professionals. Uh, the poll ran before and during a panel discussion about patient empowerment at a conference in San Diego and over a thousand doctors and nurses responded. Now, now, this isn't surprising. Nurses are far more supportive of patient empowerment, with 82% responding that it was helpful, while only 54% of doctors thought that patient empowerment was a good idea. The disparities did not end there. While only 5% of nurses who responded felt that an empowered patient was annoying, 21%, or four times the number of nurses, uh, of doctors thought that patients who were empowered were annoying. 39% of doctors said that when patients do research on their own, it's more difficult to deliver care, while 24% responded that patient research made care less difficult. Doctors and nurses agree that often patients can have very different ideas about what patient empowerment actually is, but most doctors chose these two definitions most. The patient asks about pros and cons of treatment options and drug side effects. The patient takes an active role in deciding which treatment or drug therapy is most useful for them. One of the reasons why so many doctors aren't fond of patients who take more control of their health is 92% say that this adds time to the office visit, much beyond, and often beyond the time that is allotted for the visit. Now, I think this is a legitimate concern that can only be addressed by scheduling things differently. I mean, I totally understand that in the context of a 15-minute visit to renew a prescription, there just isn't much time for chit-chat about anything, including the pros and cons of refilling the prescription. There was considerable disagreement about whether or not an engaged patient leads to better outcomes. Not surprisingly, almost twice as many nurses as doctors thought that the outcomes were better when patients, was, patients were more involved. Comments collected from doctors and nurses reveal the differences in mindset. One emergency doctor said, quote, lay persons rarely use their research to create a differential diagnosis, but rather to support their preconceived ideas. Well, I find that doctors are pretty good at supporting their own preconceived ideas, but I digress. A nurse had a different take, saying that even bad online information can lead to a productive discussion and often open the door to even talking about uh, diet and lifestyle improvement. While the nurses were more encouraging than doctors, a significant percentage of both groups specifically indicated that their uh, patients should not be empowered, 53% of doctors and 46% of nurses. However, and this is often the case, personal experience can change somebody's mind quickly. A former nurse who is now a patient replied that in this role, she can see the need for patients to advocate for themselves, reporting that she caught an error in her own care as a result of her own diligence. So when these people are on the other side of the issue, they have different ideas. There's a book called um, How Doctors Think by Jerome Groupman. I read it years and years ago. And one of the things that inspired Dr. Grootman to write the book was when he had a medical issue and uh, said to himself numerous times during the uh, process of resolving it, my gosh, I'm a doctor and I'm having trouble figuring all this stuff out and, and sorting through the nonsense. So just think about what the poor patient must be going through. Part of this information is encouraging, a lot of it is not. I mean, decisions about medical care are very personal, they're quite important, and the, suge the suggestion by a significant percentage of health professionals that taking an interest in one's health and being proactive in decision making is annoying goes beyond the pale, and I think it represents the ultimate in poor customer service. Now, I use that term customer service deliberately, Patients are customers of the healthcare system, and they deserve at least the same amount of respect that they expect to receive. Respect that they expect to receive when they uh, eat at restaurants and buy cars and houses or plan vacations. I mean, other situations in which people are customers, the person will go out of their way to make the the individual making the purchase feel welcome and heard and all that sort of thing. So this idea that patients should just show up in a medical office and do whatever they're told without ever asking questions, it's a bad one. Um, and it's evidenced by the fact, every day in, in this building, where people come in here and say, oh my gosh, if I'd known them what I know now, I never would have agreed to this diet, this surgery, this test, whatever. Well, the only way to change this is for patients who encounter disrespectful healthcare professionals to fire them. I mean, we have to starve the bad people out of business, and we've got to start really rewarding the people who are good. And just in this past week, I had a couple of folks uh, email me information 
uh, or a, a, you know, a little bit of uh, detail about interactions they had with doctors. In one case, a patient asked for information um, justifying a flu shot. And uh, the doctor replied, I don't have it, but it's out there. You might want to go to the CDC and see what they have to say about it. Well, my gosh, that's reassuring. And then another patient was told, um, uh, we don't, when, when he challenged his doctor um, with information, the doctor came back and said, well, I haven't read any of that. And frankly, I don't have time to read all of that. But you can trust me. The stuff I read says the opposite. Well, I feel better already. <laughs> Deep sigh of relief. The stuff you read shows the opposite. Okay, then. Well, we'll proceed. So anyhow, it, you know, just we need some change in the system and voting with your checkbook is one way to do it. All right, on to the next, next topic. Sometimes I think it's a good idea to take a minute and just think about our relationship to the world around us and the other creatures who inhabit the earth. Humans are a bit selfish. We tend to think that we're pretty special, much more sophisticated than all other creatures. As it turns out, the human experience is just the experience and much of it is shared by other creatures too. And this includes depression and anxiety. Those of you who are pet parents um, have seen this yourself. Cats and dogs can become very sad when a human or pet in the household dies, and they can become anxious when their routines are changed. And almost everybody who's had pets around for a good part of their life will tell you that this is true. As it turns out, even fish can become depressed, according to experts. Julian Pittman, a professor at the Department of Biological and Environmental Sciences at Troy University in Alabama, says, quote, the neurochemistry is so similar that it's scary. He says, we tend to think of fish as simple creatures, but, quote, there's a lot we don't give fish credit for. In fact, they're smart enough to use tools and to recognize faces. Unfortunately, Pittman's recognition of fish and their capabilities has led him to use them as research subjects for antidepressants. To do this, he places zebrafish in new tanks and watches where they spend their time. Hanging out at the bottom of the tank can signify depression, while spending time at the top indicates curiosity and exploring the environment. Apparently, zebrafish are just like humans. When they become depressed, they lose interest in food, toys, and normal activities. According to Victoria Braithwaite, a professor at Penn State who, does, uh, who studies fish intelligence and fish preferences, one reason that fish become depressed is due to lack of stimulation. She recommends putting, if you have fish at home, put new things in the tanks and move them around just to keep the fish you know, interested in their environment and prevent boredom. Behavioral biologist Cullen Brown concurs, stating that when fish live in a complex environment, plants to chew on and obstacles to swim around, they're less stressed and they even experience increased brain growth. Well, this makes some of the research using fish particularly cruel since they can clearly think and feel. Um, for example, back to Pittman, another of his experiments involves inducing depression in fish by keeping them drunk on ethanol for two weeks. And then he cuts off the ethanol, which sends the fish into withdrawal and thus then into depression. When the fish are given antidepressant medications, they usually start swimming more at the top of the tank within two weeks. Apparently, Pittman completely missed the um, significance of his own statements regarding the similarity between fish and humans. I can only hope that he's not planning to do any of these types of experiments on humans and you know, would not get a review board to approve them. Well, in addition to all of this, it might want to make all of us think twice about the cruelty associated with um, raising fish on fish farms and about eating them. You know, a lot more people these days are becoming increasingly disturbed about farm animals with fur coats and cute faces being tortured, and they don't want food produced in this way showing up on their dinner plates. I think some of these folks think that these types of things don't matter for fish, and apparently they do. So um, this came from an article called Fish Depression is Not a Joke, which was in the, which was in the New York Times. So uh, all God's creatures and all that, we should have a little more awareness. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it. And I will be back to you next week with more news.